Adjustment layers allow you to make non-destructive changes to your projects in Affinity programs. They're very powerful, but can be a little overwhelming at first. In this video, we'll look at all 23 adjustment layers and how to use them. So let's jump in. What's up guys, it's Trent. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about all the adjustment layers in the Affinity products. They're supported in Affinity Designer, Photo, and Publisher. So this video will be relevant for all those programs. Now I'm mostly going to be using Affinity Photo here just because it has a couple other extra features that are better for demonstration purposes, but just know that this will work in all the Affinity programs. There are a few differences, but I'll point them out during the video. Now this will be a longer video as you can see, so let me set the stage to make the best use of your time. First, I've divided the video into chapters, so if there's something you're interested in, you can jump right to it. If you look in the description down below, you can see all the timestamps for the different sections. Now, I tried to group things logically together, but don't read too literally into this. They could have been organized a different way, and I just kind of chose the one where examples that are related are kind of near each other. Second, I made a video a few weeks ago called RGB Color Basics. If things like the numeric values of colors and histograms and channels still confuse you, I recommend watching that video first because it will make these topics a little easier to understand. Finally, all these adjustment layers could easily have an entire video dedicated to them. I tried to make one example per adjustment layer in this video just to give you a basic idea of how they work. If there's any that you want more detail on, feel free to leave a comment below. Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's do a brief review of how the adjustment layers work, and then we can start looking at them one by one. Adjustment layers are literally a layer you can add to your document to give it some desired effect, whether it's changing colors, increasing highlights or shadows, exposure levels, and a variety of other things. You can add an adjustment layer by clicking this button here, and I'll click it and you have all these options here. As I said, there are 23. So for this introduction, I'll just choose a very simple one called black and white. And if I click on it, you can see my layer is added here to the top of my stack. So an adjustment layer affects all the layers that are below it. So you can see if I drag it at different levels, it will only affect the ones beneath it. So it's just affecting the apple right now. I can drag it up and affect the orange and the apple if I put it in that position. But what you can also do is take an adjustment layer and attach it to an object. So if I just want the orange to be adjusted, I can drag it over the orange name, let go, and now you see that the adjustment layer is actually a child of this object here. And I can toggle on and off with the visibility option here. Now let's just go back to the simple scenario. I'll drag my adjustment layer up to the top. So it's affecting everything below it now. Now, one of the cool features of adjustment layers is that they also support masking. Now to do that, what you can do is you have an adjustment layer here. I'll just click on the mask layer button. So the way masking works is that black will hide your layer and white will reveal it. And levels of gray will kind of be different levels in between. So let me go to pure black here. And you can see if I increase my brush size, I can erase part of my adjustment layer and it shows what's below it. If I want to partially do it, I can do gray, so I'll do I'll put some gray here and you can see it's only masking a little bit. So it's only having a little bit of that black and white effect. And if I want to completely get it back, I can do, I can go to white and my black and white layer is having its full effect again. Now, if you want to see what the mask is doing, you can alt click on it. I can see exactly what my mask is here. And then just click off to get back to your normal view. Now in a previous video, I mentioned how you can actually write on the adjustment layer itself as a mask, and that is still a possibility. The only thing I don't like about this is that it's much less flexible. It's harder, you can't expand it here, and it's harder to toggle it on and off. So this is toggling the whole layer on and off. I can't really do much with the mask of the adjustment layer itself. So the way I recommend now going forward is to actually just instead of writing on the adjustment layer itself, just add a mask to it separately. It gives you much more flexibility to turn things on and off, and even just delete it if you just want to completely not use it anymore. Now I've opened Affinity Designer here just to show one difference. Masking of the adjustment layers does work in Affinity Designer, but you just need to go to this pixel persona over here and then select your paintbrush. And then from here, you can just start masking out by drawing on the mask layer over here. But just remember that in Affinity Designer, you have to go to this pixel persona. And speaking of differences, one other difference is something that is unique to Affinity Photo, which is the ability to save presets. So let's say I have my adjustment layer here and I make a bunch of crazy changes. I don't know. Let's say this is something I want to save for other files for some reason. I can click this Add Preset button. And I'll just call it Trent uh, Black and White. And I'll click OK. Now you may notice there's no load option here. Now to do that, you actually have to bring up the adjustments tab. So you go to window, select adjustment, 
And these are all the adjustments we had before. What I can do, because it was a black and white preset, I can expand black and white. And here we have my black and white adjustment. So for example, if I deleted this adjustment, if I was on my adjustment tab, I could click on my name here, Trent black and white, and it would add it to the object that was selected. So you see it added here. I could just drag it up if I want it to be affected to everything. But on this adjustments tab, there's lots of other presets for the various adjustments. So hue, all these other things we'll talk about are here. But this is kind of useful if you want to save some of your adjustments. Again, as far as I can tell, it's only available in Affinity Photo, but it's kind of a neat feature. Okay, that was a crash course in how adjustment layers work. Now let's actually talk about what each of them do. And we'll start with the ones related to colors. So let's start with color adjustments. Now, when we look at these tools, keep in mind what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to find the easiest way to control our colors or values. And depending on your needs, different tools will be more suitable for the job. So let's start with the HSL adjustment. So here I have this picture of some cherries and what I'll do is select my layer in the layer stack here and I'll add an adjustment. And the one we're gonna look at right now is called HSL. Now this stands for hue, saturation, and luminosity. Now the first thing you'll notice is we have this color wheel here, and it's actually two wheels. There's an inner wheel and there's an outer wheel. And what this is going to show us is the original colors and how they are being changed to new colors. So let me just give you a quick example of that. We have this hue shift slider here. If I drag the slider around, let's make it something crazy like blue cherries. What you see in the color wheel here is that red has been mapped to blue. And of course, this is what's happened if we look over here. They were red, now they're blue. Our background was originally this kind of mint color. Let's see what it is now. So over here, this mint got mapped to this yellow color here. So this is what this wheel is telling us. Inner is the original color and outer is the new color. So in addition to hue, we can adjust saturation. So I can remove all saturation to get black and white. I can increase saturation to the max to get very strong colors. And down here we have luminosity. So if I go all the way down, it's black and I can kind of add light. There are many ways to change light and brightness. This is one of my least favorite, but it's an option. So if I keep going up, it'll be totally white. Now, one thing I'll mention is you can also toggle HSV mode. And what that is gonna do is just, it's gonna change the way luminosity works. So if I increase luminosity to the max, you can see it doesn't go fully white like it did with the other one. It's just kind of really making the colors strong here. Going all the way down does full black. So if you're used to the HSV model, which is hue, saturation, value, you can check this, but I usually just leave it unchecked. And by the way, if you wanna quickly get back to your original settings, of course, you can just click reset here. So I'll do that right now. Now, as you saw, when I rotated the color around, it did the whole image. Maybe that's what we want. Usually it probably isn't. So what you can do is you can actually target specific ranges and they give you some predefined ranges here. So let me click on red. And what you notice is that these four dots come up over here. And if I move my hue slider, Notice how it's only changing the cherry colors. So you're not seeing any change really in the stem because the stem is green and I'm only changing the red range here. So these dots over here, what do they mean? Internally between these two middle dots, your color is getting completely changed. And what's happening is as you go from the internal dot to the outer dot, the effect is kind of fading to merge back into the color wheel itself. So essentially at this last dot, the effect is 0%. It's just the normal color again. But what I can also do is you can click and drag these dots. So I can drag it around if I want. I can also narrow the range here in the middle if I want, or I can widen the range. So you can see this, especially if you look in this area here, you can see as I widen the range a little bit, it's gonna have a different effect as it starts to get closer to the greens. Now each of these can actually be modified to what you want. So let's say there's the purple option here. I don't really need this purple slot. What I can do is I can click picker and I can choose a color in my image. So let me choose red. Not really needed because we already have a pretty good red, but I could do this if there was a color that wasn't already supported here. And now with my custom color here, I can change this again to something different. But this picker option is useful if one of these colors doesn't really suit your needs to begin with. Now, just to do a quick review of the masking option, you may have noticed when I changed my strawberries over here, this was being affected a little bit too. So if I toggle it, maybe you just wanna have it limited to this area. So what you could do is you could add a mask. And then what I would do is I would just paint black over this. So that's a good way to fix problems when even if you're isolating some color, it's kind of affecting other things. You can use the mask to kind of fine tune it a little bit. So that was the HSL adjustment. Now another way to change colors is to use the recolor adjustment layer. So let me add that here. I have my layer selected and I'll select my adjustments and I'll do recolor. 
Now immediately you'll notice we don't have as many options as we did with the hue, saturation, and lightness adjustment. This is kind of affecting the whole thing. So if I drag around, my whole image is just being affected uh, at the same time. I don't have that option to specifically target things anymore. So what I did ahead of time is I made a mask of these cherries. So I'll just get my mask and I'll copy it under my adjustment layer now. So let me add this mask under my adjustment layer. Now the mask is just only affecting the cherries themselves. So if you want to see what the mask looks like, I just made a mask there to only affect the cherries. You know, it's kind of a rough mask, but it'll do for demo purposes. And you can see this color here is quite a strong effect. So what I could do is I could perhaps dial it down a bit, maybe increase the lightness, decrease the saturation. I mean, it's never going to look perfectly realistic since they're blue cherries, but this gives you an idea of what it can do. I can still rotate it around. So the key with this one is you're probably going to have to do a mask at some point. So you may be wondering what is the difference between recolor and HSL? Well, I think recolor in general just has a much stronger effect, which isn't to say it's better. It's just a stronger effect, which may be more relevant for your situation. If you have a color where you just really have a well-defined area and you want to completely change that color, like maybe it's a car, or a fruit or a sign or something like that, you can see that recolor is really gonna do that very strongly. Whereas with HSL over here, you still have a little bit of the fringing on the edges. Now some of those things can be changed with masking and changing those adjustment dots I showed you in the HSL controls, but really it's just about the effect you want. So some images recolor may be the better option for changing the color and in others HSL might be good enough. Okay, now let's look at the vibrance adjustment layer. Now, I have these three images here. They haven't been changed yet, so don't try to look for any differences. But what vibrance can do is it can increase the saturation in your image, but kind of in a smart way. So a lot of times what happens is when you increase saturation, some parts of your images hit peak saturation before others, and it looks very uneven. And with vibrance, it's kind of smarter about how it does that. So I'll add this vibrance filter here, and I'll just max it out so you can see the effect. So this is full vibrance here, and you can see it kind of added these yellows in really nicely. The green looks a little bit better, and nothing looks too crazy or out of whack. Let me go to my saturation image now, that's this one. I'll go to that same filter, this vibrance filter, which it also has a saturation slider here, and I'll increase it to the max. And you can see it looks like this. So we can see the difference between max saturation versus max vibrance. Max saturation kind of gets a little bit reddish. Maybe it's a little too strong. So very often I find myself mostly using vibrance more than saturation, but it's going to be a judgment call based on your image. I do find it convenient that vibrance and saturation are both on the same interface. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll increase the vibrance and then maybe I'll just tap up saturation a little bit to see if it looks like what I want. But that's vibrance in a nutshell. It's not a terribly complicated adjustment layer, but it's pretty useful and I use it more than saturation. Okay, so much like Vibrance was kind of a smarter version of Saturation, Selective Color is a little bit smarter version of Hue. So let's add that adjustment here. I'll go to my list and Selective Color. Now what you'll notice here is first the most important thing is this colors drop down here. Whereas the HSL adjustment had a visual indicator, this one just has a list. So let's say I select the reds. This means I'm going to be adjusting the red color. And what we can also do here is, unlike anything we've seen before, we can reduce the value of a color. So we can take something out. So we're doing our reds, we can actually start taking out the blues to make it stronger red. So with the cyan here, if I reduce the cyan, it's gonna make this red even stronger. If I increase the cyan, adding more blue, it's going to make it weaker. And the magenta is kind of the closest to the red here. So if I increase that, I can do both at the same time. I can increase the magenta and I can decrease the cyan to get it really strong. And this is obviously, Pretty intense effect, but that's the way it works. We can be more subtle if we want, just you know, bump things a little bit in each direction. And I can toggle on and off to see what the effect is before and after. Now, if you're wondering how do you know that reducing a color increases the opposite? Well, if we look back at the color wheel here, we can see that the opposite of red is cyan. So we also have this relative option here. And let me make an extreme example again so we can see it. You can turn on and off relative and that's just gonna increase the strength of the effect based on the proportion of the color in the image. So it's one of those things where you can just kind of toggle it to see do you prefer it with it or without it. Now if I want to change the color of the outside of the watermelon, it looks kind of green so I'll select green. Let me zoom in a little bit closer. And one thing you may notice is that nothing too much is happening there. And I selected green, it looks green, and nothing's really changing. Well, actually, this is more of a yellow color. So let me color pick that green, or I call it green, but it's actually not. 
If we look at where it appears, it's actually really influenced by the yellow. It's in that middle area, but if you find sometimes where a color just isn't being affected, it might not actually be the color you think it is. So let's go to the yellows here. And now you can see when I select the yellows, I'm having much more of an effect on that edge of the watermelon here. But that's just kind of a trick where if something really isn't having an effect on a color, double check to make sure it's really the color you think it is, especially when you have these lists, because sometimes a green might actually be yellow, you know, a magenta might be more of a red or something like that. So it's something to keep in mind. Now let's look at channel mixer. Now to review, channel means the red, the green, or the blue part of the pixel. So the red part of the pixel is our red channel, the green is our green channel, the blue is our blue channel. Now I apologize for the boring color here initially, but we'll do a real photograph after. But I chose this color specifically for this example because it's gonna show the math really simple. And don't let the math word scare you. It's actually not that hard. So what this color is, is actually red 100, green 100, blue 100. And that makes a gray. And I chose the 100 value just to make it actually easy to see what's happening. So what's happening? Let's look at our channel mixer here. And by the way, just to review this here, red, green, and blue, it's showing a sample of our color here. Keep an eye on this because it will show you what color we have here. So I've opened up our channel mixer menu. Now, what happens is we have this red channel. We're on the red channel. So we're only gonna be affecting the red values here. Now it's 100%. What happens if I decrease it to 50%? Well. If I go to 50%, actually I'll just type in 50 so I can get it exact. Our red value is now 50, okay? So we decreased it from 100 to 50 because we decreased it 50%. What if I make it 125%? Okay, now red is 125 because we increased it 25%. So that's why I chose this color of all the 100s to make you easily see kind of what, what's happening with the percentages. If I increase it 200, our red is now 200. Now if I go to zero, the red is gone. And if I go less than zero, nothing really happens anymore. So you're probably wondering why that's a thing, but you'll see in a minute. So let me reset. Now this tool is called the channel mixer. What this means is we can take the values of one channel, for example, blue, and add it or subtract it to the values of another channel. So again, remember we're in the red channel here. What happens if I take green and I add it by 25%? What you'll notice is that our red went to 125 because it added 25% of green, which is 100, to our red. So now we have red 125. Let's say I added 40% of our blue channel to the red channel. Well, now we have 165 total for our red because we're getting 25 from the green and 40 from the blue. Let me reset this now. We can also go in the other direction. So let's say I, can, I want to do minus 25 of my green. Well, now my red is 75. Let's say I want to do, you know, subtract 10 from the blue. Now we have minus 65 because we've minus 25 and 10, which is 35 from our 100 in the red channel. So that's one of the reasons why we can go negative. The negative value is not really going to affect the current channel you're in. So negative red isn't going to have much of an effect on red, but negative green and negative blue can be added to the red here. And we can also do things with the alpha, but I won't mess with that too much. And just to further reinforce the point, of course, if I went to the green channel here, I have this green. Let's say I wanted to add 25 of the red. Now we have the red added to the green. So green is 125. So this kind of just shows you mechanically how it's working. Let's actually now look at a practical example of a photograph. So now I have this image of a beach scene and what I'll do is I'll add the channel mixer to it. And we can see as my image has lots of greens, lots of blues. Let's say I wanna strengthen the greens and strengthen the blues as well. Well, I can go to the green channel and let's say I just wanna boost up the greens a little bit, let's say one, I don't know, 120 or so. And I'll decrease the blues that are affecting the green channel. So you can see my trees are a little more vibrant here. So this is before, after. Now that affected obviously some of the blue parts of the image as well. So let's go to the blues. And here I can perhaps increase the blue a little bit. And I'll decrease the green a little bit there. So you can see the effect we're having on our image. Now it's okay, but something you can also do is change the blend mode of all your adjustments. This is supported in all the adjustment layers. So I'm gonna actually choose soft light here. And I think that looks better than just kind of the normal channel mixer by itself. So what the blend mode does is it takes your adjusted image and just applies it to your original image again. And let me toggle on and off. So this is before, after, before, 
after. So that's kind of a quick summary of how the channel mixer works. It's nice when you want to make your red, green, and blue channels kind of act either in opposition to each other or perhaps you know reinforcing each other together. Okay, now let's look at gradient maps. And this is a super cool one because you know this is almost entirely the secret behind Instagram filters and all these other things you use. So let's check it out. I have this black and white image here. I'm starting with black and white because it's simpler to begin with. And if I go to my gradient map option, I'll click on it. And we get this result here, which doesn't really look that spectacular, but it kind of gives us an idea of what's happening. What the gradient map tool does is it takes a range of colors and maps it to a range of values. So if I go back to my original image, you can see all the black parts on the outer edge, you know, eyebrows, the coat area. Turn it back on. These are all black because it's mapping the red to those dark areas. The middle area, all this green is the mid-tone. So it's taking this green here and it's applying it as a gradient to the middle colors. And the blues are where it's really strong white. So let me turn it off again. You can see these are the strongest whites around here. So this is a visual representation of what the gradient map is doing. Usually you're not gonna use these colors. So let's actually look at a more realistic example. So I have this scene of a city street here. So let me add a gradient map to it. And just a really good basic gradient map here is to delete the middle option. Then we can do is we can reverse our colors here. So let's make the blues, the darks, and the red temporarily, the lights. So I'll just click reverse. And this, this gradient tool works like all the other gradients. You have the ability to insert points, delete points, and everything like that. And what I'll do is I'll take this red and let's make it an orange like that. Looks pretty good. Now, really the key to getting the most from the gradient map tool is to use a blend mode with it. So what I'll do here is I'll select, instead of the normal blend mode, I'll select soft light. And now you can see the effect that it's happening. Let me toggle it before and after. So this is with the effect. So without, with the effect. So no filter with a filter. And this is really a good way of changing the coloring in your lights and your shadows and getting kind of a totally different feel for how your image looks. I have another image here, let's try it again. So I'll do my gradient map. I'll delete the green, reverse it. And then instead of red, I'll do perhaps an orange. And then I'll do the soft light. So this is before, after, before, after. And of course, while it's live, I can change the color to see what else I can make it look like. So I can try different blues, get all these different effects going. If you have something you like, just to review, you can also add a preset. This is for affinity photo, so I can say, I'll just say trend gradient. So if I click OK, let me apply it to my other image so I can go to the adjustments and gradient map. So they give you some predefined ones here already. I'll select mine. And you can see it just automatically has the effect there. So they have some predefined ones. Um, ultraviolet, nuclear, let's try nuclear, see what that looks like. So again, the point isn't really to use this just like this. You're gonna to wanna to select one of the blend modes. So I'll do soft light. And this is before, after, before, after. Looks kinda of cool, looks kinda of like a, I don't know, 70s Polaroid photo or something like that. But this is really one of the main keys of how things like Instagram filters work and all these other tools. I think they add some vignette stuff too, but this is a major part of it. So I really recommend getting used to this gradient map tool if you wanna add those cool filter effects to your photos. In this part of the video, I wanna talk about adjustments to help us adjust light and shadows, specifically exposure, brightness and shadows, and contrast. Now to understand how these tools work, I wanna introduce you to a visualization called a scope, and that can be accessed going through window scope. Now you get this visualization here and it kind of looks like a sonogram or something like that. There are different ways you can look at the data. You can select these different options here. But for now, we just want to look at the intensity waveforms. And the way this works is that up and down represents how bright an area of the image is. And left to right is literally the left to right part of our image itself. So for example, this leftmost part is representing the leftmost part of our image here. The rightmost part is representing the right part here. And we can see that by, if I select a brush, if I just make a black mark down the side of the image, you can see it essentially draws a black mark right through our scope here. If I go through the middle of the image, 
this is the middle of the image. You know, if I do this, we get this effect here. So this kind of shows you the left to right nature of what this scope is doing. And then going up and down, we have all the different pixel counts. So let me undo this. I'm also going to be using the histogram a lot in this section. So to view the histogram, you can go to window histogram and I'll separate it. Now, as I said in a previous video, the histogram is going to count the colors we have. And this is actually different than the scope. This is going to be the value from left to right. So all my dark values are on this side, all my light values are on this side. And then going up and down, it's counting how many of those pixels there are. So using these scope and histogram functions, let's look at how the different light and shadow adjustments work. And we'll start with exposure. Okay, so let's add an exposure adjustment to our image. I'll select my image here and I'll click adjustments and exposure. Now exposure is going to determine how much light is coming into your camera. And with exposure, a little bit goes a long way. So for example, if I put in two, it goes really crazy here, as you can see. So a lot of times I do values that are even less than one, like 0.5, let's say. And I'll toggle it before and after. So this is before, after, before, and after. Now, one concept that's useful to understand is this concept of clipping. And that means when we have values that go outside of the range of our image. For example, if we have a color that goes all the way to pure white, or we have a color that goes down all the way to pure black. And we can see clipping when we look at the histogram here. So let me increase the exposure and look at how much stuff is bunching up at the edge here. So you can see all this kind of information we're losing. And essentially that is because we're burning out part of our image. If I do the color picker, you can see that it's pure white in these top areas. So 255, 255, 255 is white and we're just getting all this pure white up here and that's represented by this part here in our scope it's also represented by everything hitting this ceiling here so if I lower the exposure let me reset it to what it was originally this is what it is and you can see this part of our image is the brightest if I make the exposure greater it's going to keep going up and eventually it's going to hit that ceiling and that's where we're going to get our pure whites. So this is very important to realize as we look at the other adjustments because they're gonna behave differently in this area. Now we can also darken the exposure. So I'll bring it down. And you can see we're getting more crunched down to the dark values and we're getting more crunched down here. So that's how exposure works. I'll reset it again. Like I said earlier, a little bit goes a long way. So often I'll do something less than one. Um, you know, maybe even one in some situations. It's gonna depend on your image. Now let's compare this to brightness and contrast. So now I'll add a brightness and contrast adjustment. So I'll click this button here, brightness and contrast, and watch what happens as I increase the brightness. Obviously it looks like it's getting brighter because it is, but even when I max it out, we still have a little bit of space between us and the ceiling here. And over here, it's not really clipping to the edge either. So that's one of the differences between brightness and exposure is that brightness tries to preserve your range of values in the high areas a little bit more. And if I take the color picker, even if I look around here, nothing is exactly white. It's very close, but nothing is quite there yet. And same thing with my scope down here. There's still a little bit of room you can see between the top and the white. Now if I reset it and let's go darker, kind of a similar situation happens where there's still space down here. Nothing is exactly going to full black yet, but it is pretty dark. So that's one of the big differences between brightness and exposure. So now let's look at the contrast slider here. And one of the easiest ways to understand contrast is to just look at what the histogram does as we move it. So as I decrease the contrast, it's trying to crunch everything together in the middle of my histogram. And this is what gives images a gray look when everything's pressed into that middle mid-tone range. So I'll minimize the contrast as much as possible. And you can see the histogram is all smashed into the middle here. Now, if I increase contrast, it's gonna to start to pull it apart. And you can see we have these very extreme uh, endpoints here. And that's what we see in our image. Lots of really bright brights and lots of really dark shadow areas. Now, by the way, kind of a side note is that a lot of people when they get cameras or phones these days, which are the same thing, of course, they take pictures with their nice new camera and they get very discouraged when they look at the photo and they notice that it looks very gray. But actually gray is very good because when you have gray, it means a lot of your information has been preserved 
in the range of your image. And what these cameras often expect you to do is they're trying to give you as much data as possible and they're expecting you to bring it into something like Affinity Photo and use these tools to pull apart the values yourself as you see fit. So really, when you see gray, don't necessarily think it's a bad thing in a raw photo. It's actually very beneficial because you're getting a lot of information there. When you take a photo yourself and you get the photo and there's pure white or pure black, that means you probably did some clipping. That means you're probably losing some information on the outer edges. Again, maybe that's what you wanna do. Um, some people do try to tune their cameras to get those pure whites and blacks immediately when, when they take a photo, but don't necessarily think that gray is bad because it does represent information in your photo that you can use. Okay, now let's look at shadows and highlights. And I chose a different image just to give us a different scope to look at, to give you a little practice of seeing different images. So just to review the scope, what this is telling us is left to right, it's telling us the values in our image. So these blacks here are going to be all these parts down here. And we have lights up here, which are going to be these. Now just to remember, up and down is the value. So it's kind of a coincidence that the higher parts of this image are the lighter parts, but left to right does represent left to right in the image, but up and down is actually counting the values. So I've added a shadows and highlights adjustment and it's just the default setting right now. So of course, if I drag the shadows up, the dark parts become lighter. If I drag the shadows down, they become darker. Now the key thing in this adjustment is to see how the scope behaves. Because what happens when I adjust the shadows is you're gonna notice only the bottom part of this scope is going to move. So as I adjust it, watch the bottom part of the scope here. Let me make it brighter. See how the bottom part is moving up. And if I make it darker, the bottom part is moving down. But the top part is staying the same. And that's because we're trying to isolate the shadows and the highlights. So let me reset it. If I just adjust the highlights, you'll see the bottom part stays the same and the top part moves. And there's a little bit of jitter in the bottom part, but for the most part, it's staying relatively unchanged. So this is really the key feature of this adjustment layer is that it's trying to separate these two halves of our image and it's really great at isolating them in that way. In this section, we're going to review adjustments that are based on color reduction. So a very common technique is to have a color image and make it black and white. Now, there are approximately 16 million colors that we can use in our documents, but there's only 256 levels of black and white. So there's lots of decisions we can make in how we want to reduce the colors to get to that level. So we're going to look at ways to do that in this section here. But let's start with a simple example. What if we just want to convert our image to pure black and pure white? For that, we're going to use the threshold adjustment. So as a first example with the threshold, I've created this black and white swatch here of pure black on the left going over to pure white on the right. And I have the histogram open here so you can see the spikes for each of these sections. But anyway, let's look at the threshold tool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to our adjustments and threshold is right in the middle somewhere, right here, threshold. Now what threshold does is it converts our document to black and white, pure black and pure white. But what you can do is you can move the slider around to determine where that cutoff will be. So right now the cutoff is in the middle, but I can drag it to the left to include more of my different bars here, okay? So as I move it left and right, I'm changing that cutoff part. And it's a very sharp cutoff because my colors, I should say my black and white values are very sharply defined. Let's look at a gradient example. So let me turn off this slices. So now I have this gradient here and let me add a threshold on that. So once again, you can see as I move it back and forth, I can change what the cutoff point is. If I move it to the right, everything below to the left of this point is being converted to black. Everything to the right is being remained as white. Okay, so what does the threshold do with a more complicated image? So here I have an actual image with color in it as well. So let's add the threshold to that and you will see that it actually goes to pure black and white and I can move the threshold back and forth. Now, what is the use of this feature? Well, one of the really useful parts of the threshold tool is that it helps you find the lightest and darkest parts of an image, which is something we're going to be using in an upcoming section. So for example, let me show you this image again. I'll turn off the threshold. So let's say we wanna find what is the brightest point of this image here. Well, I'll turn on my threshold. And if I move the threshold up, we're only limiting ourselves to the brighter parts until eventually nothing will show up anymore. So here we can see, this is the brightest part of our image here. And if I turn off the threshold, 
you'll see it is basically the brightest part. Maybe I just care about what is the brightest part on the model here. So let's turn the threshold back on. If I move the slider back, so we can see this is the brightest part of the model here. So let's look at it. So basically the teeth and kind of the cheeks here. So if you want to know like what is your white point, that would be a good place to look. Let's find the darkest part. So I'll turn the threshold on. I'll go all the way to zero. And what I'll do is I'll start dragging over. So we're kind of getting, you know, dark of the hair, dark in the sleeves, these parts here. As I drag it up, you can see where other shadows are. So some of the eyes. But I think that's a really useful feature of the threshold tool is finding the brightest part and finding the darkest part. And also if you're a painter and you want to practice isolating highlights and shadows, the threshold tool is a really nice feature to help you do that. Okay, so what if you want to do a threshold, but you actually want to maintain color? Well, that's where posterize comes into play. So I have a new image here, and what I'll do is I'll add the posterize adjustment. And that's going to be found here. So what happens is it starts to reduce the colors in our image. And you can see it has this kind of um, isolated look where we're seeing patches of colors in different areas. So if I zoom in, you can see it's just solid colors in these different areas here. And if I increase it, we get more colors. And if I decrease it, it gets simplified. Now, something that's really important to note here is that this number does not represent the number of colors. For example, right now I have it two. I can see at least three, probably even four colors here. We have yellow, red, two blues, a black, a white. So what Affinity calls this, they call this the complexity. And I don't know exactly how it translates to the number of colors you have, but just remember that it isn't the number of colors exactly, it's complexity. However, there are ways you can get around that and actually get the colors you want. So let's look at that now. One thing you can do is, let's say, let's put this down to four. What we can do is we can add a black and white adjustment to this image. So I'm gonna do that now, I'm gonna click this. I'm gonna click black and white. Now we're gonna look at black and white in more detail in the next section, but for now, we'll just leave the basics here of black and white. And actually when you do a black and white adjustment, you do get the correct number of levels for what you've selected here. So if I do three, I have three levels of black and white here. I have black, white, and then I have a gray. If I do four, I have four levels of gray. I'll put it back to three for now since that'll be easier. Now one thing we can do is something we looked at earlier, which is add a gradient map. So let's add a gradient map here. Now we have three colors here. So each of these colors can map to one of our values. So let's say we have black, Let's say we want like a dark, super dark black there. The lights, let's say we want it to be kind of a bright pink or something like that. Let's say we're going for some pop art poster. Maybe we can make the shadows pink like that. So this is one way you can actually choose what colors you want in the different parts of the image. So you can change the colors to whatever you want. Perhaps this is some kind of pop art thing where it's a, you know, posterized look. You want to only have three colors. If you had, you know, other options you want to do, you could increase the posterized adjustment to say four. You could add something else in, so in our gradient map, probably here, this could be something. And you could kind of do whatever artistic style you wanted with this. One thing I'll also say is that you could actually do a smoothing effect with a brush. So what I did here is I added a pixel layer above my image. And now if I select, say, a low gray or something like that, you can smooth things out if you don't want this, these rough edges. If you want to define certain areas more, you can do so. Maybe you just want to clean up parts here. But for example, we know this blue area is the black. So what I can do is I can add more black in here. If I want to strengthen certain areas. A lot of times when you see these kind of posterized effects, there are some um, touch-ups that are being done to make it look better. So in that posterized example, we used the black and white adjustment briefly. Let's look at that in more detail in this section here. So I have a landscape here. Let's add a black and white adjustment now. You can see it caused it to be black and white, of course. Now you may be surprised that we have so many options here because it's black and white. How complicated can it be? Well, there's actually quite a bit of tweaking we can do to make an image look better in black and white. So I wanted to start with an image first here to give you kind of a practical example of how these things work. Let me move it down here so I can toggle it on and off. Now, if we look at our image, well, there's lots of blue here, obviously. So let's do something obvious. I'll turn the black and white filter back on. What if I dial this blue back and forth? You can see that we can change the effect our blue is having on the, in the black and white image. So if I reduce the cyan, we're getting a very dark part here because in our image, that was a lot of cyan. 
these trees are green, maybe I want to make that part stronger so I can go and I can increase it. But I can see not a lot's actually happening. It's actually happening more down here than with the trees. Well, remember what I said earlier about colors not being what they appear? These trees are probably actually more yellow. So let's toy with the yellow. And yeah, I can see right away, yellow is what's affecting those trees. So let me reset this. Let me tune it to something that I think will look a little bit better in general. Um, let's kind of tune up the red a little bit. We'll turn down the yellow. Turn up the cyan. I want to get more of an emphasis on the water than the sky. I'll turn down the blue and I'll darken up the sky a little bit. And I'll leave magenta the same. So this is the default black and white that we got just by adding the adjustment. And this is my black and white. So you can see it's quite a dramatic difference. Whether or not you think one is better than the other, you know, it's going to be up to you when you're doing your own photos. I personally like mine a little bit more than the original here. I think the original is a little hard to find a sense of focus, but I like having a darker sky and making the water brighter here. Now let's look at a little more of the theory of black and white and colors to give you an idea of some of the problems that can occur. So here I have a color swatch with black and white in the end and in the middle I have RGB and I have the cyan, yellow, and magenta. Let's see what happens when I add the standard affinity photo or affinity designer black and white adjustment. So I'm gonna click it and let's see what happens. Now the whole image turns white, most of it does, except the black panel. And that seems very strange, but actually it's based on the way that the black and white filter works. So let's undo it again. Now the reason this happened is because there's something special about all these colors here in the middle. And let's select one. We'll do this yellow. And the reason it's going to pure white is because of these values here, the saturation and lightness. When the saturation and lightness are 100 and also 50, you're going to get a white result by the default filters when you go to black and white. Now this may seem strange because some of these colors, they just look darker to us, but that's mostly a function of how our eyes work. We naturally see blue as being darker than the equivalent yellow or green, even though they're actually the same value. Now, as I said, this 100 and this 50 means something will turn white. Let me add another square here. Let's give it some color. So it's 150, let's make it like orange or something. So I'll make it orange there. And our saturation and lightness are still 150. So when I click this black and white filter back on, you'll see this orange box disappear. And it does. I can copy it, I can make another one. Let's change that to some other color that we haven't seen yet. And I like this purple. Again, saturation 100, lightness 50. I'll turn the filter back on, and it's gone. Now I wanna show you a way we can tune our black and white filter to get rid of this problem and to have it be something that's more useful and something that we can reuse as a starting point going forward as a preset. So like I said, our eyes perceive colors in different levels of strength, even though they may actually be the same. So there's been lots of research into this over the years of how should we balance colors to best match our perception. And there's a couple different numbers we found, but basically what we've seen is that if you have equivalent colors and you want them to actually be balanced well going into black and white, you should do 60% green, 30% red, and 10% blue. So different studies have used different values of this ratio, but I'll just go with this simple one here. So what does it mean practically? Well, what we can do is for the red, I can go 30. For the green, I said that's 60%. So green has a bigger influence than red. So we're gonna say 60 for green. And blue, because blue is so dark, we need less of it. So we can actually just make that 10% of the ultimate balance. Let's turn this black and white adjustment back on and let's see what happens. Okay, so we got three colors back. So what is this? This is our blue, our red, and our green. However, we're missing the other three. So let's look at what we need to do here. Okay, so how do we get these cyans, magentas, and yellows back? Well, let's look at it. So yellow is actually red and green. So 30 plus 60, this will make that 90. Cyan, okay, so cyan is blue and green. So that's 10 plus 60, so let's make that 70. And then last but not least, magenta, which is blue and red. So that's 10 plus 30. Let's make that 40. And here we have a nice gradient of grays. Okay, so this is based on our adjustment here. And what I can do is I can add this as a preset. I'll call it better black and white. Let's go back to this other image now and let's see how it looks. I'll go to my adjustments. I'll go to black and white. And I have better black and white here. Let's add that in. Okay, so we got it to be definitely different than the default black and white. Let's compare them. So this is our better black and white, and this is the original black and white. 
So even if you don't like the better black and white, it, does, it can give you another place to start and edit it from. Now there are other tricks you can do with the black and white filter. For example, maybe we want to really desaturate this image, but mostly just emphasize his coat here. We could add a black and white filter here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the blend mode to lighten. And ironically, what happens is if, if you decrease the color, it will increase in the image. So if I decrease red, it actually brings out the red of his coat. Okay, so this is his coat. I decreased the red. So this is before, after. You can see the trees kind of went grayer, but perhaps if this was a product photo or something, you really wanted to draw the eye to the coat, you could do that to uh, emphasize the color here. So black and white has lots of other interesting effects besides just making the whole image black and white. In this section, we'll start looking at the most fine-grained controls yet with levels and curves. Now, these concepts can be a little tricky at first, but once you get the hang of it, you'll find yourself using it in all your projects. So let's start with levels. Okay, so I have an image here, and I want to start with an image just to give you a quick intuitive feel of what the levels adjustment is doing. So let's turn it on here and see what happens. Levels. So one of the first things to notice is that we can do this for different channels, red, green, and blue. Right now, I'm just going to do master, and this is just going to do the whole image all together. So we'll keep it simple to start. And what I want to look at to begin with is the black level and the white level. So let's move this black level up a bunch and see what happens. So if I increase it, you can see our image is getting darker. Okay, The dark parts are actually getting more intense. Now, if I take the white level, the opposite will happen. The lighter parts will be getting lighter. Now, you can actually do both at the same time. So I've moved the white level down here. Let's move up the black level. You can see as, I, as they get closer together, you're getting more and more contrast here. Okay, I'll reset that. So that gives you a basic idea of what the black level is doing. It's making our darks darker, and the white level is making our whites brighter. Now, gamma is going to shift our midtones. So I'll pull it to the left. You can see it's making it more lighter. If I pull it to the right, it's making it darker. And this may seem a little counterintuitive, but we can think of this as almost like a pulley. If I pull it to the right, I'm pulling the darks over into the light area. So going right is making it darker. If I pull it left, I'm pulling the light parts over to the left, to the darker area. So the image is getting lighter if I go to the left. Now at the bottom, we have these ones called the output black level and output white level. So it sounds kind of like the ones at the top, but they behave a little bit differently. So if I increase the output black level, let's see what happens. If I increase it, you notice the image is actually getting lighter, which is kind of the opposite of what happens when you're just the black level. Let's look at what happens when I do the output white level. If I drag that down, the image starts to get dimmer. With the output black level, what we're saying is what we want the lowest black level possible in our image to be. So if I move it way up into the middle, I'm saying this gray is going to be the darkest dark you can possibly have. And if I pull this white over, now this white is kind of a little more gray. I'm saying this is the whitest white you can possibly have. So with this example here, which is quite extreme, my whole image is being pushed between these two points. This is my darkest color I can possibly have, and this is the brightest color I can possibly have. So from a practical level, what do we actually want to do here? What do all these sliders and curves mean? Well, a good rule of thumb is that when you see these types of curves, you want to get rid of these gaps on the front and the back here. So for example, this is telling me there's a lot of white space we're not actually using. So I'm going to bring in my white level. I'm going to move it here. And this is actually going to say this is the new value for our whites. So let's toggle this on and off. This is without it. This is with it. So you see it got a little bit brighter. Let's do the same thing with the blacks. Now, the black is a little hard to see because it is bunched up there, but we can bring it in just a little bit here. Let's say like there. Now let's toggle our levels adjustment again. So this is before, after, before, after. And what you can see is there was just kind of like a little bit of haze that was just removed. So before, so you can see it's a little grayish, but because we did these things to fix our white level and our black level, when I turn the filter on, now it's a little bit sharper and a little bit cleaner looking. And there isn't really anything I would say we have to do with our output levels on this one since we're already, we already kind of corrected it over here to get good blacks and good whites. Let's look at a histogram to see a little more detail of what we're actually doing. I made another swatch here of black and white values and you can see a histogram here. Again, it's a very sharply defined histogram because these are very sharply defined areas. And down here I have my levels adjustment. So let's see what happens when I adjust the black level. So if I drag the black level over, first of all, just look at the bars here. Notice how even though things are slowly getting black from left to right, the whole image is still getting a little bit darker. So you can see as I'm pulling it over, 
gradually you're just increasing the cutoff point of pure black. And you can kind of think of that as what the black level is doing. It's defining where your cutoff point of pure black is. And of course, going the other way with the white level is going to do the opposite. It's defining where my cutoff is with white. Now the gamma, once again, is going to drag lights onto the left or it's gonna drag darks to the right. So if I drag my gamma to the left, it's going to make the left side look lighter because I'm dragging light colors in that direction. And you can actually see the histogram kind of shift over that way. Let's drag the gamma to the right. You can see dark colors being dragged to the right here. Now, as I said earlier, what the output black level does is it's defining what is our lowest level black. So right now this is pure black, but let's say I want to recalibrate it to be something different. Now it's this, okay? And this is my purest white. Maybe I want that white to be something different. So if I drag it down, just recalibrating my image to have this new white max here. And let's kind of bring them really close together. You can see how extreme it can be. And actually, if you just totally flip them, it uh, does an invert of your image, which we'll talk more about later. Now, one thing that's really interesting, and you may want to play with this a bit, is what happens if I just choose one channel, like red? Now, we don't need to look at the histogram anymore. It's not that important, but let's just look at the levels. If I increase the black level when I'm just at red, watch what happens. My image starts to turn cooler, okay? Now, what happens if I increase the white level? That part starts to be redder. So what happens when I increase this black level is I'm actually defining the zero cutoff point for my reds to be actually stricter and stricter. So as you go more towards the darker colors, the reds are getting more pushed to zero. And the opposite happens on the white side. So as I drag the white level to the right, more and more of my reds are being pushed up to 255, and that's causing this part to be redder. So this is one of those things, again, that's a little hard to get at first, but the more you play with it, the more you understand it. And it's definitely helpful to always kind of remember this relationship, say with red. You know, when you decrease the reds, you're increasing the cyans. And you can look at greens, okay? So green, if I increase the black level for greens, I'm getting more of this magenta color there. Blues, I get more of a yellow. We're gonna see this relationship more in some of the upcoming sections. So going back to my original image, I could select red, and if I wanted to warm it up, I could drag the white level down, and that's gonna make it redder here. Okay, so we looked at levels, which kind of allow us to work with the endpoints of our value range, and maybe a little bit in the middle too with the gamma slider. But what if we want to actually have more linear control over the whole image? Well, that's where curves come into play. So let's open the curves adjustment here. And sometimes people get scared of this one because they see a graph and it looks scary, but it's not really that scary. We're gonna go over it in detail here. So what this is showing is our input values along the x-axis here and our output values along the y-axis. So you can think of this as going from zero to 255 and again from zero to 255 up here. Now, because this is a straight line, no change is actually happening. However, let me drag this top part and if you look at what's happening to our image, I'll drag it an extreme amount just to show you. You can see our image is turning white. What this line is doing is it's taking all the input and it's mapping it to pure white over here. And these ones are also getting a little bit lighter. I'll reset it. I can drag the bottom part to be darker. So if I drag it this way, it's basically grounding all these values here. So whereas previously all these values, something here would go up and to this here, which is maybe, I don't know, 64 or something like that, if I drag it down, now this value is zero. So this is a diagram I made where you can see what the curve would look like compared to a change or adjustment. So here I have my original, and let's say we have a value of 128, which is like right in the middle. It's hitting this 128, and it's going over to the output of 128. Now when I drag the curve up, well, this 128, now if you hit the curve at this point, it's going to maybe 178 or something like this. So dragging the curve up is going to brighten it. And here I have the first example I showed you, which is the really extreme case. 128 dragged all the way to the ceiling is going to 255. So when you do something like this, you're really brightening up the image. So let me reset this example here. Now kind of a classic way to adjust an image is to do this S-curve pattern. And now really if you only know one thing, that'll probably get you 90% of the way there in life. So I'll add a point here, I'll add a point here. And when I say S-curve, what I mean is we like to make the top part a little bit lighter and the bottom part a little bit darker. And let me toggle it on and off. So this is on and this is off. This is our original with the curves, without, with the curve. So you can see what this did is it just added a nice little bump of contrast to make our top part brighter 
and it's making the bottom values in our image darker. So these darks, it's gonna be things like, you know, these shadows in the bushes, this side of the truck, you know, these other bushes over here. These brights are gonna be things like the roads here and a lot of the sky. Now, one thing you could also do is do this on a channel by channel basis, which we'll look at in more detail in a second, but let's do a brief review of how it would work. So let me select red. So maybe I wanted the brights to be more red, so I could increase that up here. And maybe I wanted the darks to be less red, so I could drag the red down here. What we can see is that the lighter parts of the image are getting more red based on this curve, and the darker parts of the image are getting less red. So that's when we could start to break down the curves into more details. Okay, so let's combine a couple things we learned into one task here, and that is how do we adjust this image to find the white and black points? Now, if any doesn't exactly have a white and black point chooser like Photoshop does, there is a white balance tool, but we're gonna do this manually here just for an exercise purpose. And I think if you wanna really understand how a lot of this stuff works, this would be a great exercise to try on your own. So to review, what we're trying to do is we wanna color correct this image so that we have an accurate black point, an accurate white point, and a good midtone. So let's see how we would do that. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create three squares, and this is gonna be our test palette for white, black, and the midtone. So let me just create it here to begin with. Now, earlier I talked about the threshold tool and how it's a great option for finding the highlights and the blacks and the midtone. Let's turn on the threshold here. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna find what is the lightest part of this image. So let's drag the threshold over. Let's move it out of the way. So I wanna find the whitest part of our image. So let's go here. Obviously, I'm gonna ignore those squares. All right, so it looks like somewhere in here would be our white. So not a surprise that probably this snow is our whitest point. So this square here is going to be our kind of fake white point, like what our white is at the moment. So let me go here and target our snow. And I'm gonna make this our uncorrected white point. Let's find the black point now. So I'll turn the threshold on. Where's the darkest part of our image? So somewhere over here, what is that? Yeah, the shadow of that rock. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to sample that rock. And now let's find the midtone. So I'll turn the threshold on. And to find the midtone, what you want to do is get your threshold slider to the middle and then just kind of rock back and forth and like see what is changing. So what's a good thing in the middle? I'm noticing this rock over here. Let's take this for our midpoint. So this area is gonna be our middle gray. Okay, so now we have our uncorrected white, gray, and black points in our image. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna group them. Now I'm going to add a curve. So the curve is just affecting these colors here. So if I drag it, notice only these are being affected. Now I have this info panel here. What I wanna do is I wanna sample my fake white here. And I can see what the colors are here. It's 255, 252, 240. So what I wanna do is I wanna adjust my white point here such that these colors are pure white. So let's look at the channels one by one. Red, our red is already 255, so I'm not gonna mess with that up here. I'm not gonna change anything here. Let's look at our green. So the green is 252. So I'm gonna move my green slider left until my white point says 255. So I'm gonna slightly move it 255, okay? So I've adjusted the green. Our blue is 240. Let's look at the blue channel. So let's move the blue to the left until we get 255. And there. So now we have 255, 255, 255. So this curve is correcting this color to be white now. So if I select, if I hover over it, just to reinforce that, it's white. Now let's look at the black level. So I'll readjust our target here. All right, so 10, 13, 20. So let's look at the red channel. I wanna change the red here. So let's get it just so we can get it to zero. There, okay. Green is 13, let's, I'll edit the green. Let's get it to zero. zero and blue is 20 so let's get the blue to zero and there we go 
Okay, so now this is our new black. So if I select it, you can see it's actually zero, zero, zero. And finally, let's go to our gray color. So for gray, we want 128, 128, 128. Now let me look at the threshold again, because this is a little bit of a blue part of the image. Let's see if there's a part that's actually grayer. I think I'm liking this area more for the gray, so let's do that. I got a new gray, let's adjust that now. So I'll go back to the curves. Now I'll drop a point in the middle here, and I see the red is 128. So the red is already perfect, 128. Green is 146. Let's look at the green. I want to move it down to get 120. There we go. Now I'll go to blue. So blue I want to drag down. No surprise, there's lots of blue because it's a very blue image. So now I have this corrected curve here, and let me drag it out to the whole image and let's see what it looks like. So you can see the change that happened. So this was the original image, and this is the new image with our new white points and our black points in our middle areas. So if you select this snow, you're going to see it's much closer to white than it was before. And these dark areas are going to be black. Now this is kind of like a good overall correction. And of course, you can start here and then tweak it further. For example, you can adjust the strength of the curve adjustment. So maybe you don't want it to be full power. Maybe you want to dial it down a bit. So that'd be original, slightly fixed. Original, slightly fixed. Maybe you want it to be full strength. But let's say the blue, the blue we took down a lot. Maybe we can put the blue back in. Maybe we can give it a little bit more of a blue. So you can tweak it as you see fit if you see something that's kind of off. But hopefully now you kind of see more of an idea of how to start using these curves. And again, this is the exercise I recommend going through. Um, it'll give you a lot of experience kind of playing with this tool. And if you like the final result, you can, of course, change it. You don't have to go by what you get on the first try. So we just looked at the curves adjustment, but the color balance is going to give us another way of doing kind of a similar thing. Let me add that adjustment layer here. Now here what you notice is probably a similar pattern. We have cyan's opposite reds, magenta opposite green, yellow opposite blue. And let me quickly kind of just show you an example of what can happen. Now note the tonal ranges here. We can select shadows, midtones, or highlights. Let's select highlights to start with. And what I can do is I can move my highlights more towards the red. So as usual, I'll go super extreme. You can see what's happening here with the reds. I'll go to the cold side. I didn't get much of an effect because there wasn't much there to begin with, but you can certainly see if I add the reds there, you get a lot more red. If I go to the shadows, let's see which one this will affect most. Probably the blues. Yeah, so you can see if I put more yellows into the shadows, that's having an effect down here. So the key thing with this tool is really to keep an idea of what area you're in, whether or not you're in the midtones. You know, there's lots of magenta here, so you can add more of that. You can go more towards the green. But one of the key things to understand here is the relationship between this tool and the curves tool that we just looked at. So let me go to highlights and let me really increase the reds. So if I do this, so this is highlights with lots of reds increased, okay? Now let me turn off this adjustment, no color balance. Let's go back to our curves. Now how would we do the same thing that we just did with the color balance? Well, we would do red and then we would basically drag this up here. And if you notice, essentially, that's what our color balance tool was doing. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's very similar. So with the curves, when I increase the red, this is what it looks like. Our color balance with the red and the highlights, that's what this looked like, okay? So these are really kind of two different ways of thinking of the same thing. So if you want fine grain control, you can use the curves here. But if you just kind of want more quick and dirty stuff, you can just select the shadows, midtones, highlights here, and then adjust as you see fit. Now let's look at the white balance tool. So that's actually a little bit simpler than the other tools we've looked at so far. So I'll open it up. And you can see we have these two sliders, the white balance and the tint. So the white balance is going to determine the temperature of our image. So I can make it cooler. So I'll drag over to the blue side, very extreme of course. Or I can make it warmer. So I'll drag over to the orange side. By the way, this may be yellow in old versions, but it's orange now. So that's the color it is. I'll bring it back. And we can also control the tint. So we can go more towards the green side or towards the magenta side. So let me reset everything. Now the idea behind this picker is that we're trying to find our white point. So I'll click on it. And if I try to choose something that looks relatively white or what I want to define as white, it will adjust the white balance slider here, okay? Now with the picker tool, we have a couple options. You can click and if you drag around, it kind of keeps a running average of what it should be. So you can kind of do that as one method. Another method is when you click it, if you hold Alt, you can drag a square and it'll take the average value of an area. So perhaps I want to get the average of this kind of 
light area here and I can let go and it'll, it'll calibrate the average based on that area. So that's a quick overview of this tool. It's fairly straightforward. All right, let's look at probably what's the simplest adjustment ever, which is invert. So I have a black and white image here. I'll start with black and white and I'll go to invert. And what you notice about invert is there's not even any options. It's just a one click thing and it does its job there. So it's pretty straightforward. Again, you can adjust the opacity and things like that. And you can do different blend modes. Maybe there's some kind of effects you want, but it's a very simple one. So let's look at a color image. And if I choose invert here, we get a familiar site, which is kind of this film negative image. Now just to give a little bit of the theory behind invert, if I take this red square and I duplicate it, let me invert the square. Now the question is what exactly is happening here? Well, you can think of invert as basically going 180 degrees around the color wheel. So you can see red is on this side and then over here is blue. You can also think of it as inverting the numeric values of the pixel. So if our red is 255, 0, 0, inverting that gives us 0, 255, 255. We can invert another color. So let's say I have this green here. It's not pure green, but it's 92, 255, 71. If I invert it, let's see what I get. So I get this purple here. So the 92 is inverted to 163 because the sum of them is 255. 255 is inverted to zero and 71 is inverted to 184. So that's just kind of how the math behind it works. But the invert adjustment overall is pretty simple and straightforward. Now let's talk about filters. Filters are ways we can make it look like our photograph was taken during a particular time of day or even from a certain type of camera. And speaking of camera, let's start with the lens filter adjustment layer. Here I have an image of a lake and some mountains. Maybe it's early morning or evening. I guess you can't really tell unless you know where it is. And I'm going to add our lens filter adjustment. So let's go over here. And it's one of the lower ones here at the bottom, lens filter. So I'll click this. And what this adjustment does is really just add a subtle effect to your whole image based on this color here. And we can actually change this color so I can rotate around and do any color I like on the color wheel. But orange is a pretty common default setting, just kind of simulating sunlight. And you can increase and decrease the strength of this effect. So I can bring it all the way down to nothing or I can go up and I can go crazy to 100%. So something you can also do is play with the preserve luminosity checkbox. We saw this in some of the other controls. It kind of helps maintain the value structure of your image. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's not. You kind of gotta turn it on and off and see which one works best for you. Now 100% is strong, probably hurting your eyes. I'll go to 50% here. But the power of this filter really comes in the blend mode, which is what we saw with some of the other adjustments also. And my favorite one is usually soft light. I think that one just works really well in general. And I can even turn up the intensity of our filter here. And sometimes when I do this, I might even just experiment with different colors too. Like what does pink look like? Let me move this out of the way so you can see it better. You can kind of go around the whole color wheel. If you want to put a more cooler tint, you can obviously go on the colder side. But it's really going to depend on the scene and what you think is best for the style you're going for. Now one difficulty with this adjustment is that it affects our whole image at once, whether it's the light parts or the dark parts. So next we're going to look at an adjustment layer that can actually isolate this filtering effect separately between the highlights and the shadows, and that's called split toning. So let's check that out. Okay, so let me turn on the split toning adjustment, and that is here right below lens filter. And it looks a little bit different than lens filter, but it's really very similar to it, except now we have this split between the highlights and the shadows. So let's make the highlights, let's say orange. And you kind of got to turn up the saturation to see the effect, but let me increase it here. And I'll toggle on and off. So this is on, this is the original. Now it's with it there. Maybe I can even make the saturation a little stronger. I'm going overboard on saturation just to show you the effect. So this is before, after, before, after. Now let's look at the shadows. So let's do something different for the shadows. Let's go really cold here and I'll increase the saturation. And you can see the shadow area is getting blue. So this is a way to kind of give an interesting feel to your image to have contrasting lights and darks with the warm and cool colors. So I'll go before, after, before, after. Now a good rule of thumb if you want to get good contrasting colors is to choose colors that are on the opposite side of the color wheel. So I did orange for the highlights here. On our color wheel, we can see the opposite of orange, we have these blues. But another thing you can do, let's just make our orange 40 even. Instead of going through the trouble of like trying to manually find out where it is, you can actually just go to your shadows hue and you can just say 40 plus 180. 
and that will take you halfway around the circle from 40 degrees. So I'll hit enter and I have the contrasting color. Like the other one, we have blend modes here and let's go to soft light again. Let's see how that looks. Now we also have this balance setting. So if I go to the right, it's going to be more of what my shadow color is. So it's gonna be colder. If I go to the left, it's gonna be more of what my highlight color was. So it's looking warmer here, but I'll just put it back in the middle. But this split toning is a really useful technique if you wanna get different lens effects in the highlights in the shadows and just the basic lens filter isn't doing it for you. Split toning will be the one you use. Now, so far we've been making all these image adjustments manually, but what if we just wanna load a file and have it automatically apply a style to our image? Well, that's where LUTs come into play. Now, the name sounds a little strange, LUTs, but it stands for lookup table and the name's not really important, but the concept is what matters. You can think of LUTs as essentially a pre-configured file of adjustments. And to be clear, this isn't just an affinity concept. LUTs are used across all sorts of graphics applications, whether it's DaVinci Resolve, Photoshop, lots of other graphical tools and video editing software. LUTs are so common you can actually download them on lots of graphic design asset websites. So here I am on Envato Elements and I can just type LUTs into the search bar and I'll get all these different options here, okay? So this one looks like it's aimed at food. If I'll click on that, you can see they have demo images here. So this is kind of before what it looks like and then you apply your filter, you get this after. Here's another example. Let's go back to the search bar, see what else they have. And I'll scroll down so you can see lots of options for what you want. Something you can also do is even say something like vacation lots. And you'll get a lot of stuff with this with like beaches and pre-configured settings that are really good for like tropical areas and all that kind of stuff. So you can see some here. And a lot of times they'll give you some type of swatch that shows all their different styles. So I found one I like as an example here. It's this one, 50 Paradise Professional LUTs. And since I have a subscription to this website, I can just click download and bring it to my computer. So I'll do that right now. So on my computer, I downloaded and unzipped this LUTs pack. And if I expand the folder here, there's lots of different files, but the ones you really care about are these cube files. And this is the standard format for the LUTs, as you can see. So I'll go back into my Affinity Photo instance here. So let's go to the adjustment and I'll click LUT. Now the options are pretty simple here. I'll just click load LUT and I'll navigate into the folder and I'll just choose one. So let's do, let's do the first one. And you can see quite a dramatic effect. Let me close the window here. Let me toggle before and after. So this is before and this is after. Before, after. And if you open the LUT controls, what you can do is you can, again, change the blend mode. So you can do soft light if it's a little too crazy. And I think that's actually a better effect here. So again, before, after, before, after. You can change the opacity also. So maybe you still wanna make it a little less intense. But that's really the basics of how you would apply a LUT that you downloaded from the internet. Now let's say we made a change to an image and we wanted to save it as our own LUT that we could apply to another image. Well, let's look at how we could do that. So I have this image here and I'm gonna make some modifications to it. Um, I chose some colors that I think would be good for a gradient map. Let's see how it looks. I'll add the gradient map. And for the dark colors, I'll use this brown here, mid-tone, I'll use this middle one. I got these colors from another image. And for highlights, I'll do this light one here. Set it to soft light. I'll close our gradient map. So we've applied a gradient map so before, after. Let's uh, adjust the curves. Give a little bit of an S curve up there, down there. Let's also adjust the vibrance. It's always good to try that one. Main goal here is just to make it look different so we can see some type of effect. All right, so let me toggle these on and off. So this is before, after, before, after. So let's say we want to save these settings as a LUT that we can apply to another image. All I have to do is say file, export LUT. And this is going to give you a preview of what your effects look like here. It's just kind of a default image. There's a way you can load your own image, but I'll just use this for now. And I'll call it a Trent Demo. The reason I name things after myself is just because I want to know like what I created versus what the default settings are. So I don't accidentally overwrite things. So I'll say export. And I'll just save as Trent Demo Cube. That sounds good. Save. So here I loaded a totally different image. Let's apply the LUT that we just created based on the other image. So I'll go to my adjustments, LUT, load, and I'll choose my cube file. So let's go open. And you can see the effect it had. So let me toggle it before, after, before, after. You can change our blend mode. And that's essentially one way you could export your adjustments from 
one file and import them into another file. So that's one of the nice things about LUTs. One final thing I'll just mention is that I did notice sometimes when exporting these LUTs, if I imported them into another file, there'd be no effect. And it seems like that might be a bug in Affinity. I checked the forums and someone logged it there. So hopefully that will be fixed soon. The solution is really just keep trying it a couple times and maybe give it a different file name, maybe restart Affinity Photo and try exporting the LUT again and importing it into your other file. So just give it a couple of tries, but hopefully it's a bug that will be fixed at some point in the future. In this section, we're going to look at the adjustments that are used for getting accurate colors when printing. We'll also look at the normals adjustment, which is used a lot for 3D texturing. So let's start with the soft proof adjustment. The soft proof adjustment is designed to help us see what an image will look like when it's printed out on paper. If you've ever been surprised by how an image looks when it's coming out of your printer, this is something you may want to consider. Now there's no magic technique that can make paper look as good as a fully lit screen, but we can make our screens look a little bit more like the paper. So let's see how we could do that. So I'm going to add the soft proof adjustment here. And what you can see is as I select these different profiles, it's having a different effect on my image. It's making it kind of look maybe more washed out or whiter, but this is trying to simulate the effect of being printed. Now each of these profiles correspond to different combinations of printers and paper. So I can select down and you can see which ones are available. You can also find these files on the website of certain printers. So for example, I'm on the Canon website here. And if you scroll down, you can see these ICC profiles. And these will help you determine what your output will look like on certain types of paper. So you can go down different printer settings here, different papers, and they explain it in more detail here. If you're working with a professional print shop, they may also be able to give you some of these files or ideas on how to get more accurate colors. So going back to Affinity Photo here, let me just pick one that has an obvious difference, say Japan Color Uncoded. So you can see this is what it looks like on my screen, and this is it trying to predict what it will look like when I print it out in the real world. Now what's interesting here is there's this checkbox called Gamut Check. So let me check that. And what you can see is that a lot of my image is turning gray now. And what this is doing is this is showing which part of our image is out of the gamut. So it's saying, what is the part of your image that can't really be printed accurately? So this is the gamut check on, this is it off. Now what this gives us an opportunity to do is try to correct our image so that we can get more of it into the gamut range. So let's see how we could do that. So here I'm going to add a levels adjustment. We looked at this earlier. So what you want to do is you want to drag your levels adjustment so that's under your soft proof. And then if you open it, what you want to do is you can actually set your black level so you get more of it in the range here. So notice how I increase my black level. It's showing me that it can print more and more of these colors. So you can see the effect my levels adjustment is having. If I turn it off, so much is out of gamut. I turn it back on, it's coming back in. I'll move these two adjustments up top also just so it's simpler to see. Now what's important is if you were to print this, there's a couple things. One, you want to turn off the soft proof adjustment when you print it. So you don't want to print with the soft proof adjustment on. The soft proof adjustment is just to kind of verify what it looks like on your screen. So you're just kind of seeing what it looks like and then you're turning it off when you print it. Another good practice would be to put these adjustments in a specific folder. So I'll group this levels adjustment. There's only one there, but I'll just say printing adjustments and I can turn it off when I'm doing my normal work. But you wouldn't want to have these printing adjustments on if you're exporting the image to be shown on a screen somewhere. You want to kind of clarify in your workflow that these are just for print. So that's an overview for soft proof. It's useful for kind of not being surprised when you print things out. Like I said, if you're working with a professional print shop or something like that, contact them and see if they can give you the correct files for what you need to like represent their printer. And hopefully you'll get a more satisfying result. Next we'll look at OCIO, which stands for Open Color IO. Now I'm here on the Open Color IO website and this is another way of loading profiles that can accurately represent color, this time across different devices for the most part. Now this is another way of representing color accurately across our workflow. Specifically, this is more targeted for the filmmaking community where you have multiple people working on different software, on different monitors, you know, across different screens. And it can be really important to make sure colors are consistent across all of them. So these profiles help ensure that. Now, if you don't know what OCIO is, probably you don't have to worry about it. It's the kind of thing where, you know, your boss or your team would tell you if you needed to use it, I assume. But if you're in Affinity Photo, there is a way to add the profiles. Going to settings here, edit settings, under color, and here under open color IO, you'd be able to select the profile to load. 
And over here, if you added the OCIO adjustment, you could add the source color space and the destination color space. Now, I don't have a valid OCIO configuration to show you, but I'm here on the Affinity documentation, and you can see they have this example of a before image, and then if you applied the correct OCIO adjustment to it, this would be the after. So I go before and after. Now, my impression is that OCIO isn't as fully supported in Affinity as it is in some other products right now. So I think if this is something you need, I recommend checking out the Affinity forums and asking some questions and getting some more feedback there. There's some threads there where people have kind of gone into detail on what's supported and what isn't. So you can find more information there. But it looks like OCIO is something that is starting to be supported more in Affinity, and perhaps we'll see more of it going forward. Now for something completely different, which is the normals adjustment. This is an adjustment that's going to help 3D developers and people that work with textures. So there's a little bit of background to understand this one, but let me try to build it up here. I have this textured sphere, and this is kind of what you would see if you were looking through a 3D asset library to kind of browse textures and surfaces and things like that. And this is showing kind of a rocky stone sidewalk texture. And I can actually show you what the texture itself looks like. So here we have this texture, and this is just the RGB color data. So this over here is being used to make this on the left. Now, if you notice, if you look at this sphere closely, there's lots of like details and it looks very uh, three dimensional. You can see the edges are a little bumped up a little bit. There's lighting effects happening. There's all sorts of subtle little depths and cracks and things going on. Whereas this texture is really kind of flat. So how do these things work together? Well, in addition to the texture, we have another file called a height map. And what the height map is going to do is it's going to help the 3D program determine the height of the various elements of this texture. So white areas are higher and dark is lower. So I put a little height demonstration down here. So this would be like a cross section of our texture, if you will. And different gray level values are used to represent how high something is. So 120 up here would be higher than 75 down here. And you can see that in the cracks. The cracks are the low part and the lighter parts are higher. So this height map is combined with the texture by the 3D program to help give us a little bit more depth. But there's still another problem, which is it doesn't really tell us which direction these surfaces are facing. So that's where we use a normal map. So here I have a normal map. And what each of the pixels in this diagram represents is what we call a vector, which is an arrow that points in a certain direction. So you can see this is my surface here. And these arrows are all pointing where the surface is facing. And what's interesting is that each of these lines has an x, y, z coordinate, and it's translated into an RGB value. So just to give a little more detail on what a normal vector is, it's an arrow that points at a 90 degree angle from a surface. And we can define it by x, y, and z values. Now I have a 2D image here, so it's x and y, but in a real 3D map, it would be x, y, and z. And these values can be stored in the RGB data of the pixel at that point. So this is another example of a normal map that is used to describe these shapes. So you can see that this is a cone and this is kind of a donut and this is half a sphere. And these colors are telling a 3D renderer how to draw the surface. Now what Affinity does is it gives us the ability to look at a normal map like this and add a normals adjustment to it. So that's what I've done to this file here. And what you can do is you can actually rotate the direction of the arrows. So if I drag this slider left and right, you'll see it goes back and forth. You can also flip the direction. So for example, if this was the normal direction it was pointing with the normal orientation, if I clicked flip Y, this is essentially reversing my normal map. Let's look at another kind of cool thing we can do with normal maps. So I'm back in Affinity Photo and I've loaded my texture here, which is what I showed you in the previous example. And this is just my RGB data. Let me now load the corresponding normal map for this. And I should say the normal map is going to be exactly the same size as this texture. So I'll do file, place, and here's the normal map. And I'll make sure snapping is on and I'll just perfectly center it over my original texture. I'll rename it normal just so we're clear where it is. Now what I'm going to do is add a channel mixer adjustment to this. And I'll go to channel mixer. And I'm not doing anything crazy. I'm just going to set the output to gray. Now finally, I'll add the normals adjustment to this. So let me go and add the normals here. I'll move it under the channel mixer. Now what's really cool is if I zoom in and I rotate the normal, you can see that it's kind of moving a little bit because I'm rotating the direction that the vectors are pointing in. So what I'm gonna do is for this whole layer, I'm gonna set its blend mode to hard light. Now I'm gonna zoom in. Now watch what happens if I rotate the normals. 
it looks like the light is actually moving around. So if you focus on this stone here, see how the light is on the edge there? If I rotate it around, the light is actually moving around to the different sides. Same thing with the darkness on the stones. So you can see the darkness is here. If I move around the normal map, you can see light is happening in different places. And this can actually be done on a much bigger scale than just kind of textures like this. If you have a 3D representation of a room or a building or something like that, and you can also output the normal map image for it, you can do a similar thing to adjust the lighting dynamically. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with the normals map. This is just kind of just scratching the surface, but it's nice that Affinity kind of puts in these 3D tools for us also. So that was a review of all 23 adjustment layers. As you can see, there's lots of different things you can do with them. I really only scratched the surface in this video and you could dive deeper on any of them and spend a lot of time learning them and improving your work. I'm also planning on making a video of all the blend modes. So if you want to be notified when that comes out, be sure to subscribe to my channel. In the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.